All right, Tony, take it away. All right, Holly, thank you so much. I think this is the first time we've done it smoothly because of uh, I've been inept in, in following the rules. But nevertheless, uh, our focus tonight uh, will be to uh, uh, make sure that we maximize our time so that we can protect your evening time with your family. So we'll spend about an hour here tonight. And we want to talk to you about uh, our focus with getting our schools reopened. And uh, um, Holly will be taking some time to share with uh, the task force some major decisions on a flow chart that have taken place. Now, it won't be all encompassing regarding all the decisions that had to be made, but some major ones that had to be taken care of and discussed thoroughly. Uh, then we're going to uh, talk about the school board's approval of our plan, and I'll be joined with Chris Willis. Uh, we'll have an update on athletics from Marty Parkhurst. Uh, we will have a return of our staff plan by Lynn Rosalini, and our return of our and celebration of our primary students. Uh, both um, Christy and Alicia will be talking uh, with us about that. And then we want to give ample time to the committee to uh, provide us feedback and ask us any questions that they may have. So uh, with that, I, I just want to also add that um, I'm extremely pleased with the great work that the, the administrative team with whom I've been working with, they've done a great job planning and, and focusing on what's best for the reopening of our schools. We, all, we don't always agree. Uh, we have some uh, differing opinions from time to time, but it's a great working group. And I'm just a really fortunate superintendent to be uh, to have inherited such a talented group of people. So um, thank you to the administrative team. You have done a great job and I have a great deal of confidence in our plan uh, being executed, that's for sure. So Holly, why don't you spend a few minutes and share with this task force some of the major decisions that we had to make over a, uh, quite a period of time. And many of them were not easy decisions. Many of them were not quick decisions to make. So Holly. Bear with me here a second as I present my screen. Hopefully um, it's, it may not be large enough for everyone to see it, but we'll go over it. Uh, and I'd be happy to send it out and share it with everyone. So as you can see in this flow chart, um, there's a lot of planning and a lot of logistics and involved uh, when it comes to planning for reopening of schools. And we're just gonna briefly go over all of them. Please note, you know, this is a very high level overview of all of the steps um, and logistical planning taken by the district throughout the planning process. It's not inclusive of all of the sub steps of each step listed. Uh, if anything, it, it kind of minimizes the amount of work and hours and effort that goes into each one of these steps when it comes to planning for reopening. So at the top left, I'll try to enlarge it so you can see it. So initially we started with a, a survey to the staff to ensure that we have enough staff to reopen our campuses. And then we confirmed our open enrollment choices for all students to confirm that we have adequate staff to support the enrollment choices for our families. Then we met and we continued to meet with our union partners to ensure we have their support to return to in-person instruction within the terms of the MOUs negotiated based on the recent changes to the K-12 decision tree for provision of in-person education. Then, of course, meeting with all of you tonight, we have met and will continue to meet with the reopening of boarding schools task force and to continue to plan for the next steps. Um, initially, when this was created, it was continuing to plan for the next steps for reopening in our board presentation. Then we presented a tentative reopening plan to the school board uh, for approval to proceed with the reopening of boarding schools. Um, in italic, kind of down below, it's kind of small. Um, if the school board agrees with the tentative reopening plan, we will continue to take the following steps for reopening. Um, we did receive that approval, so we continued along the flow chart. So then we needed to determine the placement for families based on student and family need and transportation logistics. We need to evaluate staffing levels and rearrange classrooms and our staff assignments based on the enrollment, staffing availability, and option need. 
Then we needed to recall staff while allowing adequate time to ensure that they can secure childcare and other barriers for return to in-person instruction. And we're kind of in that phase right now. Then we need to configure food service logistics to ensure that we can serve all students on and off campus simultaneously. Then we need to determine transportation logistics for reopening by location and student based on an AB rotation that's currently um, in progress as we speak. Then we need to reconfigure the master schedules to ensure that we can meet the COVID guidelines for reopening by grade level and by school. And then we need to procure and ensure that we have adequate technology and resources to offer instruction simultaneously for students in a remote modality and those receiving in-person instruction um, when needed. Then we need to secure and place attestation and social distancing protocols in the buildings for students and staff safety while they are on campus. Then we need to ensure all on-site staff have COVID safety guideline trainings and all PPE are in place. We're in progress and working on that as we speak. Then we begin our phased in um, in-person instruction and a slow phased in approach based on the COVID metrics beginning with P5, so that's preschool through fifth grade, students on a bi-weekly interval as outlined in our reopening plan. Then of course, we always need to evaluate the return to in-person instruction protocols and efficiency by primary schools and finalize plans to begin phasing in the secondary schools, grades six through 12. Then approximately four weeks prior to the return, um, we begin our six period schedule for our secondary students to prepare, excuse me, to prepare for return to in-person instruction. And then we start to phase in the secondary students on a biweekly interval based on the COVID metrics and phase two plans as outlined um, in our proposed reopening plan that was approved by the school board. And then lastly, if you guys can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, students will remain in a phased in hybrid model until further notice due to COVID-19 restrictions and Tacoma Pierce County Health Department recommendations. And of course, down here at the bottom, you'll see that our phased in return to in-person instruction is subject to COVID-19 metrics. Test positivity, local infection rates, and hospitalization rates are subject to Tacoma Pierce County Health Department guidelines, modifications, and exceptions to the above planning for reopening may be necessary due to changes in the safety and health conditions of our school community. Dates for return will be announced by grade level as they are confirmed. So as you can see this flow chart, 19, 18 steps, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into the planning of reopening our district. And it's not as simple as opening the doors, even though we wish that it could be. Um, but this, again, is just a very high level overview of, of the work that we are doing um, as we continue to plan for reopening. So we just wanted to share this. We want to share this with the community and the task force and let everyone know there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of work going into um, the planning for reopening. So. Back in, in May, we didn't have a roadmap that included all of these very important components. You know, if we ever have to return to uh, a process by which we need to um, move away from in-person learning and then back into in-person learning, we've got ourselves a roadmap uh, that will be fine-tuned, of course. But I'm very proud uh, of these components that uh, Holly has uh, compiled and uh, again, they are the major building blocks of a roadmap to return uh, to the reopening of in-person learning and instruction for our staff. So uh, we're excited about the possibility. Um, as soon as uh, next week, we are going to see uh, a large number of our staff returning to the buildings, followed by uh, uh, our youngest students in the pre-K through first grade returning on February 8th, and you're going to hear more about that. Um, I want to share with you that that uh, the board last Thursday approved a plan that we believe um, addresses bringing our youngest students in, um, in first through the month of February and early March. Uh, of course, we're hearing uh, from a large number of people in the community that want the middle school and high schoolers to return quickly 
or as soon as possible. And uh, it is our hope that we will be able to do that. But our first test is bringing our pre-K through five students in, and we hope to be able to bring them in, in safely without any uh, transmission of infections. And that's a high standard, a real high bar to, to hold uh, up to, but we're gonna do our very best with our safety protocols and our distancing and our disinfecting and all the elements that are part of our safety plan. Uh, here to share parts of that safety plan with you is Chris Willis, who I have to say has done an outstanding job and uh, many thanks to you, Chris, for your uh, paying attention to all the details that uh, are included in this plan. Chris. Thank you, Dr. Apostle. Um, so one of the things that I didn't know I was getting into when I was turned into the safety person was the fact that I was going to have to deal with a pandemic. Um, I really thought this job was more about fire drills. And so, uh, and I learned, I learned, I've learned the hard way this year and in a good way. I've learned um, a lot about, a lot about um, pandemic and the safety measures that need to occur. Um, I know that we're going to be going through three phases of bringing our elementary students back, but I want people to remember um, that we've had over 220 students already in our system since September 8th. Um, we've had added an additional 40 students, 30 students, sorry, 30 students um, who struggled with access from technology uh, to homelessness uh, to foster care. So as a total of about 260 to 270 students, we've actually had a lot of practice. Um, we've also had over 30, 30 staff members on campus and we've had a lot of practice um, dealing with and working with social distancing, um, the wearing of masks, uh, sanitation, um, and now, now that we've gone through it, we have all these, all the teachers coming in right now, uh, other teachers coming in, we have a seasoned group of people to help lead the way. We have a seasoned group of people in our special ed department. Um, we have a seasoned group of people actually in our title lab department, uh, ELL department, um, who, who know and have been living, living, um, the safety measures, uh, like I said, since September 8th. Um, the paraeducators, the drivers, nutrition services and maintenance, they've all been here too. Um, they've been working since last March. Um, and so they've been practicing. They've been not only practicing, they've been doing the work. Um, they've learned what type of masks um, they need to wear. They need, they've learned how to handle the sanitation of buses on a daily basis and the cleaning of classrooms between sessions. So we've had lots of practice, thanks to Curtis, uh, thanks to Megan, um, thanks to Joanne. Um, we've been able to pull off the grab and go. We know what the grab and go looks like. And so we've had lots of practice between September and now uh, to make sure that we have a, a clear um, direction to go in with our students. Those of you who don't know, our first group of students are coming in on, on February 8th. Prior to that, um, we've already put in our um, students into transportation. We're working out the um, routes as we, as Megan, I don't know if she's working on them right this moment, um, but yep, 34, there we go. Um, she, she's working on it. And so um, she's working on those right now. We also have, in regards to nutrition services, we're working on, uh, like Holly had mentioned, our grab and go. Um, we're going to make that work. We're going to make it work for the kids who aren't in school um, because we've figured out a method to do that. Um, Curtis has figured out, like I said, a method to make sure that everything is sanitized. Um, we're coming up with um, uh, arrangements in our classrooms to make sure that we have those in place as well. So the only thing that we want to make sure, though, with the three sessions, so we start on February 8th for pre one, the next is uh, February 22nd uh, for second, third, and then for fourth and fifth, we start on the 8th of March. Prior to that, um, we'll be doing some training um, uh, with our staff regarding all the safety precautions. Um, we have a handbook um, that's online uh, for all of our staff to access, along with Honestly, everything you need to know, um, but we're forget, forget, I mean, what is it, forget to ask or didn't, afraid to ask um, regarding mask use, um, regarding cleaning your classrooms, all of that is online um, and ready for teachers. We'll also have some educational videos um, and uh, resources for teachers to use to teach their students in class as well. 
The one thing we do need from families, though, um, the first thing we need from families is for them uh, to um, sign up for the Skyward uh, Family Access. That's where our health screening is going to take place. Um, and the reason why we're doing our health screening through Skyward is it enables us to maintain a database of students uh, in the database who have actually completed the attestation or the health screening. Um, we're also going to be putting on a, a huge effort to making sure that families keep their kids home when they're sick. We, it's really important for us that keeping the students home when they're sick will actually improve outcomes for us in school. Um, students have actually, we have only have five students out of a large number of students who haven't maintained their immunization. So we want to make sure that families have their immunizations in because now it's a requirement. Um, before we had a little bit of flexibility from the state, but immunizations are a really important component of bringing kids back along with health care plans. Um, and then we want to make sure that every student, um, and the communication is going to go out, that every student, before we said, hey, here's a long list of things for students to bring, we're asking students only to bring in a few things. We're asking them to bring in their two masks, we're asking them to bring in a water bottle, and we're asking them to bring in tissue. And that and, a, and their charged Chromebook. That is it. Um, we'll, we'll utilize and we'll make sure that all of our, um, all of our students have the materials they need. Um, we had a large donation at the beginning of the school year from a variety of different agencies. I just delivered one of those um, boxes today over to PTR. Um, so we have, we'll have all of those things necessary for the kids to start because they have to maintain their own educational materials. Um, we don't want we don't want students to be sharing materials as much as possible. Uh, we don't want them sharing desks. Um, we want to make sure that there's as much social distancing as possible. Um, so during this time, um, some of our families, just to kind of understand some of the logistics, some of our families are going to undergo, mainly of our special needs groups, um, they're going to undergo a schedule change. Uh, so that's that's going to be, uh, that's a challenge. They've been used to coming in the morning. Some of them will be coming in the afternoon. And some of the ones that are coming in the afternoon will coming in the morning. And so several of our families will be undergoing some changes in that regard, not only for students coming in, but for families of students who've already come in since, since September. So they're gonna be going through some adjustment. The one thing I wanna finish with um, it finally is the, is the fact that we haven't stopped. Um, people, people are thinking, gosh, you know, what, what's the school district been doing? We haven't stopped. I have teachers that have been here since the first day of school. Uh, we've had teachers online, in person, at home. We have, we're also providing home services too during this entire time. So those people that have been doing all of those things. And so when people ask, what have we been doing? We've been doing everything. And, and, and during the most difficult time and being careful and following the rules uh, regarding social distancing, um, managing the hygiene and making sure that they stay home when they're ill or not feeling well. Thank you. I think that's about it. Anyone have questions for Chris at this time? I'll take the I'll take the raise. Jamie, <laughs> Jamie deserves one. Absolutely. I'll take the raise. Okay. Chris, uh, uh, where are you out on Gators? I was just curious if Gators were okay. Just wanted to know. Um, everyone on, in the committee, this is a setup question. Uh, <laughs> just want to let you know that right now. Um, where am I on Gators? Take a look at the L and I. Um, L and I specifically states masks. And um, yeah, okay. Um, I think that the problem with that question is that that's going to be part of my legacy, and that's not supposed to be my legacy. And so, <laughs> anyway, so to answer your question, you know, the 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 masks in general, we have it outlined in our manual regarding the type of mask to use um, from our from our self-contained programs to our um, to a lecture type program to uh, counselors. Um, and so all of those types of masks, we have all the masks um, required by LNI. The one thing that we haven't done regarding masks is have them fitted, the N95s fitted. 
if if we have a staff member who we wants or feels like they need an N95 that's fitted, we can do that. Um, but one of the things that um, LNI talks about is a shield plus um, plus a um, procedural mask is just as efficient as a um, uh, N95 mask and no gaiters. Um, so, and what's really exciting about athletics is the fact that none of the students are wearing gaiters and they're all using procedural masks. It's very funny to watch athletes out there with uh, surgical masks on while playing, um, playing football. So anyway, th that was a legit question, but it was fairly set up. No gaiters for kids as well. Yes, uh, Jamie, um, we're not gonna expel or suspend kids for it but we're going to be encouraging them. We have 34,000 masks, um, uh, children's masks for um, procedural masks, as well as cloth masks for our kids. And so if they really want to wear a gaiter, they can put the mask underneath the gaiter. Yeah, and Chris, the kids have been great about it. The kids have been talking to Switch, and they actually like those surgical masks better than any masks we have, and that's the ones I've been wearing on a daily basis, which ironically, they're the better masks, and kids have been great. Definitely see the athletes wearing them. They actually really like them. I, I was out there, I was out there um, the other day and they, it, it was funny to watch all these, honestly, blue faces out there. Well, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, at the end, near the end of our meeting, you'll have time to ask a question and something services that you need to uh, bring up. Um, uh, as you uh, all know, our young men and young women who are involved in our athletic programs uh, have, have been waiting very patiently to begin their training and to start their athletic seasons. And the uh, supervisory body, the WIAA, has weighed in on uh, setting those seasons. And our athletic director, Marty Parkhurst, has, has been the key communicator uh, to all our coaches uh, recently. And uh, I, I think that I'm hearing some really great reports from the kids and the coaches about returning and being able to practice. I haven't seen uh, Marty's uh, on, on, on the screen yet. I hope he's with us this evening. Uh, Marty's not here that I can see Tony, but so far the athletics have went really well. Um, we have about seven sports that are competing. Um, we initially thought there might be some issues trying to get athletes say six feet apart or to, um, you know, maybe socially distanced. But what we found is when we put the kids with their coaches, coaches have this amazing ability to make kids do what they want. It's it's really, as a teacher, it's, I don't know, it's almost disheartening. Why are, do they listen to coaches so well? Because coaches just have a magical touch. And uh, so we, we did a little bit of adjustment with the initial bringing kids for the attestation. We decided to have the coaches do it because the coaches put kids six feet apart and kids stay six feet apart. So, um it's been amazing. There was a text string of coaches going through and, and the coaches are just on cloud nine right now, being in front of their athletes, athletes in front of um, coaches. Um, Chris has it lined up. We're going to start um, dry running the test, uh, the COVID testing with a few of our athletic teams. And we're going to see how that goes. And then within two or three weeks here, we're going to have all athletes 16 and over that want to going through testing as well as our coaching staff. So um, everything we were hoping for with athletics is happening. It's been very safe. We have until February 9th for what's called summer. Uh, so summer training will end February 9th and starting on February 10th, football will begin. And February 15th, we will have cross country, um, girls soccer, volleyball, and boys and girls golf. And those will be our season one sports that will last for seven weeks each. So that's where we're set right now. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things um, that's important for everybody to know is that every kid has been screened uh, for COVID. And if they've had COVID in the past, a doctor has to sign off on the fact that they're healthy enough to come back to work because there's been several studies right now that uh, where athletes have been impacted by COVID um, and impacting their heart in their lungs. And so we wanted to make sure too that um, our athletes were safe coming back and having doctors sign off that they were safe coming back after having uh, COVID because we've had several teams um, uh, that have had kids who've had COVID in the past um, and they, they weren't able to start on the first day. Um, but once they got their COVID screening, that, that worked out. The other piece that Cliff told, we did secure 8,400 test kits uh, for the district, which is an extraordinary number. Um, 
I don't know. I kind of overdid it, maybe. But anyway, um, yeah, I might have. Um, that um, so that our athletes over 16, um, that our staff members as well, um, can also participate in the testing program. And we uh, did a dry run at the central office and at the at the um, high school office this this past week. Um, and we've already gotten results. I haven't gotten results, but they've already gotten the packages. So we have a system in place where um, the, the testing uh, will be done, uh, picked up, and delivered uh, to UPS all in the same day. Thank you, Chris. And Cliff, thank you for stepping up and giving the athletic report. Really appreciate that. At this time, we're going to hear from Lynn Rosalini, who will talk about uh, the return of staff and her work with various groups, uh, both classified and certificated staff. Lynn? Thank you, Tony. The really good news is that the majority of our teaching staff is eager and ready to come back and work in person and with our, our students. Uh, of our staff, uh, approximately two dozen uh, are unable to return to work either due to a health condition or uh, for other personal reasons. With those staff, we're working with them on a one case-by-case uh, -case basis. Our principals have been instrumental in working with them to see if we can find an alternate work assignment, whether it's working with the online academy or providing some kind of other uh, remote uh, learning for our students. So it's really been a team effort. And I think as, as Holly emphasized and Chris emphasized, this has been a, a effort uh, by a lot of people to make sure that we're ready for when our kids uh, come back. Our, uh, as you may know, we did furlough over 80 employees in uh, November because there wasn't the work uh, without the children there. We are calling back the majority of those staff. And in fact, our custodians came back yesterday full time in order to make sure every nook and cranny and desk and bookcase is clean. And they uh, really need to be commended because they have been working since last March. Um, and even when we uh, furloughed them for part of the time, they, they maintained uh, their efforts. And I feel comfortable uh, with our, our staff coming back, that they're coming back to a safe and sanitized uh, location. Now, that's the great news now. We know that there is a possibility that people will uh, get sick, whether it's cold and sniffles or something worse. We're also working uh, with our substitutes, uh, both classified and certificated to uh, make sure they're ready to step in. Uh, we've offered training for them. We have a lot more work to do with that. And uh, uh, we are going to continue to offer training periodically as new people come in. Uh, now, being able to open school is dependent on our workforce. And we know that people have individual uh, considerations and circumstances. And again, our, our principals are on the front line offering support, figuring out ways to make sure that people are comfortable and they feel safe coming back so that when they are at school, they're going to give their absolute best to our students. So um, our, our teachers uh, deserve um, our, our real appreciation. And I also want to thank our labor partners, uh, both OEA and PSE, who have partnered with us to really look at what it means to come back. And we've talked about various scenarios uh, and ways that, that staff and students are protected. So once again, it's a team effort, and we're looking forward to not only February 1st, we're looking uh, forward to each of those waves of kids coming back and getting back in the groove. Any questions? I just wanted to make a comment, Lynn and Chris. Um, I talked to one of my friends that's a custodian, and they were really pleased with the schedule Curtis worked out, how they're staggered so they overlap at the big need time. They're confident they have the supplies they need. They, She felt really very positive, and I was very happy to hear that because, like you said, they've been working hard 
and they, you know, they're still with us even after being furloughed. And yeah. so um, I was really happy to hear that that was so well worked out. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. You're doing a great job working with our, our staff members and accommodating the best you can, possibly can. Uh, imagine um, uh, on, on February 8th, our, our youngest students, how excited they're going to be to come to school for the very first time in their lives. The excitement uh, in, the, in the households will just be amazing. And so our two principals who will be greeting the students and their parents uh, are here tonight, I hope. I saw Alicia earlier and Christy. Christy yes. Um, uh, Christy and uh, Alicia, could you give uh, the task force a little bit of information on the, the preparations that have taken place in your schools? We would love to. Thank you, Dr. Apostle. Um, so just to let you guys all know, behind the scenes to try and move kids to the morning and the afternoon and adjusting with staffing schedules and between off online academy as and then moving back to in person, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that happen and we both know as well as our office staff how eager families are to know which whether their kids are morning or afternoon we are eager to be able to tell them as well um we think we'll be able to let all of our kindergarten through fifth grade families know tomorrow morning and once that has happened then a whole bunch of other balls get to start rolling um so once that goes out then they're going to hear some information from their teachers regarding some changes that are coming. And that includes some changes in some schedules. Um, there's some things we have to adjust now that we're moving to an A, B morning and afternoon schedule, including like our specialist schedule, for example, needed to be adjusted. So there'll be some adjustments that families will see as they stay in virtual and there you progress along until their student returns to in-person school. And then there'll be adjustments that will be made to that schedule once their student is in person, whether for the morning or the afternoon, as to what their day looks like for that asynchronous time or that time when they're home, but they still need to be doing some learning, but it's going to look different when they're what they're doing right now. So those are the some pieces to that schedule communication that are coming out. I'd love to say that's the only communication, but the number of things that need to get changed and communicated to families is a lot. And so Christy's going to talk about what that all piece looks like. Thanks, Alicia. And we vary our intentionally, not putting everything out at once. It's like standing in front of a fire hydrant. You know, it's it's hard to take everything in at once. So we actually met as a team and talked about what are the most important things. Families want to know who their kid's teacher is. And if they're A and B, those are the schedule pieces. So that's coming out. Um, and then teachers will be communicating, like Alicia said, that, that, that change in schedule. Those are the immediate pieces. Then next week, families are going to get an orientation video from each school. They'll be alike in a lot of ways, but they're also going to be slightly different because um, kids will enter, um, of course, buildings in specific places. And even though the safety procedures are the same, they'll just be a little bit different. So we're going to have some special guests um, help each um building the Mountaineers and the Cougars, understand how it is that they safely come to school, the arrival procedure, what doors they come to, if they're being dropped off on the bus, if they're being um, dropped off by a parent or walking, what that will look like when they arrive, what screening will look like so that kids can actually see that in the video and understand like somebody's gonna um, take their temperature and what, what they can expect what it will look like walking through the hallways. There might be some arrows on the floor or some feet, some signs. Um, there might be some places where um, there's uh, some barriers in the hallway to give directions. We want kids to be expecting that because some of our kids have not been in the building since last March and it looks a little bit different. We will be showing them what it looks like to go to their classrooms, having their masks on, sitting in their spaces, the materials that they will have at their space, like um, Chris Willis shared. Kids will have their own materials. In some places, classes are very used to having community supplies in the center of their table. That's going to be a little bit different. Um, some plans for how they'll have, they'll still have book boxes. They're still going to have um, books from a classroom library or from the library, but there'll be procedures on how to, 
to get those materials, um, what materials to bring to school, even though we've sent that, we want to have a visual for what that's going to look like, what the expectations on the playground are going to look like, and then how we're going to leave the building. Um, and so because we've had a little bit different procedure with visitors on campus, there's going to be some different pickup points for families. And so all of that is going to be um, what we hope in a fairly short video that parents can watch with their child um, so that they can say, okay, remember when you go in, this is what it's going to look like and they can watch it multiple times. Some kids are going to need a bit more pre-teaching. Some kids are going to watch it and be totally fine. Are there, like, I've got this, no worries. Um, so that will be next week. And then also transportation plans next week. Families can um, be prepared to see what time bus pickup and drop-offs are going to be. Any questions for Alicia or Christy? Actually, I was just going to type it, but I'll say. So one of the things I was thinking is that because there is so much information, I love the idea of the videos for the kids. You might also have it written down because that might be a lot of stuff for a parent to remember and someplace to go, oh, I can go and look up because I forgot about that one thing there, you know. Yeah. So there'll be a frequently asked question page that they can refer to that'll have that step. And so, yep, you're right, Kathy. So in an email, um, there'll be on the website and then also um, coming from the teachers themselves so that we're getting lots of ways um, to get that information passed out. Good, good. You got it. Yeah, today in our cabinet meeting, we talked about the uh, frequently asked questions and answers that uh, can be posted. And so Holly will be uh, managing that for us and, and making sure our communications are, are frequent and clear. Uh, Steve, uh, you haven't had a, a chance to say much tonight, but Steve supervises our building leaders. And, and Steve, anything you want to add that we might have missed? Uh, no, I don't want to uh, start talking because I'll get emotional. I'm too proud. We just work for such a great group of people. Work they're doing is so impressive. Just really a fantastic experience. They're just tremendous people. Hope the yeah. community members are have the confidence that they need to send your kids to us because you can see you've got top-notch people doing the work here. Really outstanding. Well said, Steve. Okay. Um, now we're, we're ready for some feedback. Any questions that the task force members uh, have for us? We have 34 people in attendance, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have for the rest of the time that we have allotted. I was wondering with the um, A-B schedule, will that stay um, throughout? Like if you're on A, you'll stay on that throughout until whatever the next step looks like, or families won't have to worry about transferring like now, first I'm in A and then I'm in B. Will it be the same? So, Chair, are you talking about the option A versus option B families? Yeah. So, if you're like, let's say I'm option A, I guess, and maybe I'm calling it the wrong thing, but like, let's say I'm, I go in the morning. My kid goes in the morning. Does that stay oh. throughout? There's not going to come a point where now I, my kid's going in the afternoon. There, we don't anticipate. We have tried really hard to make sure that those classes are closely as balanced as possible so that we would not anticipate that once we have a family and on that schedule that we would not have to make any decisions. Um, we understand that things may come up with individual families, that something may happen with your child care or something like, in that sort of situation. We may need to make adjustments, but we would not do that lightly and that would not be something we just rush to go do. Thank you, Alicia. Any other question, comments? Um, hi, hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. What does the middle school and high school look like? I remember the last task force meeting, there was a talk of maybe high school and middle school starting at the same time, because I know everyone's really eager to get those kids back to. Yeah, so Jennifer, we are, we spent a lot of time on this this morning and yesterday morning and last week three or four times. Um, 
we are working to make sure that when the metrics fall into line, um, we're in a position to get as many kids on campus as possible. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit before that there's about 60 kids a day on campus at the middle school um, in a variety of contexts. And we're looking to expand that um, into second semester. We do not currently have a date for a return of middle school or high school students um, in a hybrid model. And I, I'll i say it so Dr. Apostle doesn't have to. I know that's a frustration for many people in the community. And we are absolutely dependent upon making sure that the metrics um, in our region allow for that to happen. So um, the high school getting athletics kicked off is a huge part of getting kids back and re-engaged. At the middle school, we're still in the virtual coaching, which we started um, at the very beginning of January um, to get our kids back and involved. And we had a long conversation this morning about planning and plotting how to get our kids that are most desperate, our next tier of kids most desperate for in-person instruction onto campus um, during the course of the week. So getting, we are slowly trying to ramp up and um, as we bring all of our uh, certificated staff back, recognizing that, you know, our classified staff, and I kind of wish, um, uh, kind of wish, uh, oh my God, I'm blinking and I'm sorry for that. Um, that our PSE Gary. partners were better, Gary, thank you, uh, Director Madigan, that our PSE partners were better represented here tonight because they've, they've never left campus. And so as we talk about a return to campus, we're talking about um, our certificated teachers. Our classified staff have been with us since shutdown. And so um, the return of our certificated staff on Monday, we're starting to have some really frank conversations with folks about um, how we manage kids, what the safety protocols are gonna be. Um, our kids that are already on campus need to be housed in classrooms and so we're walking th staff through our certificated staff through um, how to manage that. And our PSE partners are way ahead of the game in terms of knowing how to do that work. So we're well on our way to um, a return of more students. And, but it still, frankly, has an intervention focus um, until our metrics get us to a different point where we can look at a more wholesale um, move. Yeah, and just as recently as even this weekend post board meeting, um, the cabinet, including Dr. Apostle, have asked me specifically about seniors, our struggling students, um, and looking at um, not picking a date. We have a lot that needs to fall in line, but I've already been kind of given the directive to start thinking about what does it look like for seniors, what does it look like for high school, and to begin that planning because I know that's coming shortly on the heels of a successful elementary transition. So. Um, we're already planning the return of both middle school and high school um, with hopeful intentions that all the data is going to fall in line. Um, and specifically, I've been asked to look at seniors and what it would look like for seniors uh, to return, uh, what that would look like for struggling seniors, for all seniors, and, and um, to work with my leadership team and the senior class leadership to uh, be really intentional about that focus. So that's work that's being done currently, and we're really excited about it. The one thing that, that I, I hope I wish to convey to the community is that we are not cavalier or arrogant about the work, the seriousness of the work that must be done to protect the health and safety of our staff and students. And we are hoping for great success of bringing our youngest students back so that we can return our older students back to the middle school and high school. But the success of being able to bring our older students back is dependent upon the behaviors, not only at school, but the behaviors of the families at home. A parent is a child's first teacher. 
as you probably recall hearing from time to time. And we, we must have the cooperation of the parents to ensure that they identify any symptoms and to keep those students home if they exhibit symptoms and to get them the medical attention they need. Uh, we can't do it all by ourselves. And so the connectivity between the school and the home is critically important. And I can't stress that enough. Um, the schools can't do it by, we can't do it by ourselves. It's a partnership that is critically important for us to be successful now. So, this is the hardest work in my 42 years in education. It is the strangest thing to do in terms of planning virtually, and I'm not accustomed to doing that. But, you know, I'm blessed to be working, as I said earlier tonight, blessed to be working with such talented and skilled people who really have a passion on doing things correctly. And uh, I'm really hopeful and confident uh, that we're going we're gonna to be successful. Absolutely. Any final comments before we break? I just wanted to uh, chime in on one thing. I, I noticed something uh, Cliff put in the chat um, regarding that the, you know, supporting the elementary for a successful start so we can get secondary back. Um, and we moved all of our administrative and cabinet meetings to a different time. Uh, starting when um, the kids start to come back on February 8th so that people can be freed up to be on campuses, um, secondary on elementary and cabinet members and whatnot like that so that we can see and assist the process and, and, and help this be really successful. So we're all really invested. And even though some kids are coming back right away, uh, everybody's got an investment in it and we've all got a part to play in it. And so it's it's pretty unified pretty unified action pretty cool i'm glad to hear that steve because this is going to be like the first day of kindergarten yeah. a couple of days <laughs> i uh i called uh carol in the bakery department at safeway uh yesterday and ordered some uh glazed raspberry filled donuts and and she says well what is this for and, and I told her that welcoming back staff on, on Monday, February 1st, and I work for the district. She goes, oh, I'm so excited that the kids get to go back to school. So there's a buzz. There's a buzz in the community. And, you know, uh, I'm excited uh, to see it again. Uh, we just just hoping for the best and that we will have all of our students back uh, sometime in, as early as, as we can in the spring. So. Um, if you are, yes, please. A question, I think, probably for Lynn. Um, I am wondering if there's a plan in place for uh, this next month while staff is back in the building at the secondary level without students. If we have a day where we potentially have symptoms that would keep us from coming in the building but would not keep us from teaching if we were remote, is there a plan in place for that type of situation? Uh, you, you, I don't think you hear uh, a forthcoming plan at this well, time. Well, um, you know, I caught that I was muted myself. I didn't have to have Steve or Chris tell me I was muted. I should get some points for that. So, um, Karin, uh, we've been facing that all along, that people have been sent home uh, or not been able to come in because of either sniffles or greater concern that they, they could have COVID. If they're able to teach from home, uh, we will uh, make those arrangements, uh, working with the principal and the person and somebody wouldn't have to take uh, sick leave. If somebody is too ill to teach, they would take sick leave. And that's why I mentioned earlier, we're working to secure substitutes. So um, there is one key, I think, to uh, this, whole issue. One is flexibility 
and the other is absolutely being rigid. We're going to be flexible on people's needs and their individual situations, and we're going to be absolutely rigid when it comes to the safety protocols. And that's how we're going to get back and be back safely. So, yeah, um, and we'll be working. We've, we've talked about it at, with our labor partners, and we're working with it just about daily. Yeah, and Thanks Karen, for asking. Yeah, Karen, one of the things that we've come into is um, actually parents have been very, very good uh, about when we send kids home with a, honestly, with a cough, uh, with a sniffle. I'm not kidding. You know, wiping their nose, that's considered a, a symptom. Uh, a cough is a, a class A symptom. Sniffle is a class B symptom. And I'm not even looking at this right now. And so, um, but... You know, we've had 66, 66 kids slash adults go home uh, because of symptoms. Um, we've had uh, 12 people, um, I'll call it excluded, um, excluded because of close, close contact. Um, and we've had three uh, staff and one student who have actually um, been infected in school, uh, but no close contact. And so um, it's, it's, it's as more kids come in, as more staff come in, and they're going to be just learning the protocols. Our staff are starting to know the protocols, the ones that have been coming in, kind of starting to get the protocols. Um, but the staff coming in do not know the protocols. And um, they're going to be asking lots of questions. And as a result, we're going to see staff going home. Uh, we're going to be seeing kids going home um, because we're, we're, we're going to take – we're going to – we're going to take this hard um, because we're going to keep kids safe. We don't want an outbreak. And remember, I don't know if you know, an outbreak is considered two kids or two people um, uh, in a cohort. And so once we have two, then things start shutting down. And so we, we have to be very vigilant um, with our thing. And it's, you know, if people ask me the question, should we send them home? I'm always going to say yes. Um, uh, because we want to make sure that kids are safe and the students uh, and the adults are safe. Thank you, Chris. Hey, Chris. Uh, just to circle back on what you said, uh, the three staff and one student were not infected in the school? No. Oh, okay. No. Nope. Nope. Matter of fact, they're all in different areas, scattered in different areas, and they're all scattered in one student. Fantastic. And here's the thing. You know what? One of the reasons why it all worked is because we social distanced and we wore masks. And that was the reason why the, the, the cohort didn't go home. Because that one, the one situation, we had six other people in that room and the other five, the other five out of the six, didn't have to stay home because we followed our own protocols. And so um, that's an important piece, same thing um, you know, because we had to check the bus too, uh, because kid came in on the bus, um, and because we followed our own process and were vigilant about it, none of those kids on the bus needed to be excluded either. And so that's why the importance of maintaining our, I'll take it, a vigilant stance um, is going to make a difference. The thing is, is that once we relax, we can't relax, and that's the hard part. Um, it's easy. It's easy to relax and going. Hey, we haven't had any, um, but it only takes one, and that one can, you know. Uh, my son is up in Bethel, Alaska. A teacher came from outside of Bethel. The whole town got infected by one teacher. One teacher, and so it doesn't take much, and so that's why we have to continue to be vigilant. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I had a question uh, maybe for Cliff. Um, I know when this first started, the end of last year, there was discussion about um, high schoolers' grades. And on their report cards, there would be some indication that this is COVID report card or, or COVID time. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and... Um, I'm just wondering, as the high schoolers are out of school for so much longer, I mean, honestly, they might get two months or three months of school. Um, 
is there any adjustment to GPAs? Like, you know how you weight, like quizzes are this weight and tests are this weight and assignments are this weight. Is there GPA going to be maybe weighted like this year doesn't count as much towards your GPA because students are getting Ds, students are getting Cs that would not get these grades and probably failing as well. But in my house, not quite that yet. Um, so is there any talk about that yet? And what might that look like? Or is that a state thing? Like we wouldn't be allowed to do that because that would look different when colleges are looking at if we decided to do it, but other districts didn't. I'm just concerned. There's there's some D grades in my house that I 100% they would not be Ds. I mean, my very athletic sixth grader in, in Karen's class is an A student for PE. That's certainly not what has been happening. I have to push him to be that. So I'm just wondering the discussion around that, um, if there has been any. Yeah, so lots of questions there and you hit a lot of it on the head. Some of it is the State Board of Education and their ability to give us access to, like last year, incompletes and the past fail and what are we doing with grading? Um, Chris Reichdahl mentioned this year that he wanted grading to go back to normal. Um, I, I, we are waiting for their shoe to drop. Is there going to be some sort of relief in grading? Um, just anecdotally here at Oregon High School, I've looked at the grades. Our grades are not astronomically different than they've been in other years. I would say the students who are failing are maybe failing harder than they usually have. So I normally have more students who are sitting in the 55 percentile that need the push than are sitting at the 35 percentile. So we're having to get more creative and how do we get those kids in and how do we get those kids engaged and knock on their door and visit their house. But um, as far as like a COVID indicator, I don't know that we're going to need a COVID indicator for this year. 2020 is going to have a permanent COVID indicator in all of colleges. Um, we've been in some post-secondary meeting with the college uh, cohorts and they are looking at uh, like for instance they're not, they're going to be test blind this year so most colleges are not looking at SATs or ACTs they're looking at what courses did you take what are you doing outside of school they're looking at the whole child and how they're going to accept students and I don't know what that's going to look like um, but I'm watching closely the SPSL meet with the principals weekly um, I'm going to make sure that Ording high school students are not at any disadvantage of other, over other students. I think there are going to be more students who have Ds. We're going to see more students who are looking. For instance, we have policy that kid could retake a course and replace. Uh, so if your student got a D and they wanted to retake the course for a higher grade, that's a really uncommon practice normally. I'm guessing that in the future, kids are going to try to access that policy more often. I think there's going to be, um, right now, the, the school board is currently looking at some board policy around competency credits, where kids can take tests for credits and kids can pass the next higher course for credits. So there, the state board has opened up a lot of opportunities for kids to prove competency when they are students who are at standard and um, are able to do those important skills. So. I think there's going to be relief, and I also think there's going to be a big giant asterisk next to um, last year's grades and this year's grades, because I think across the nation, you're going to see a dip in students' performance. And uh, yeah, anything the state board opens up, we're going okay. to the board for consideration. So, okay. Yeah, uh, that's what I was wondering. I've, uh, my ninth grader is, yeah, my ninth grader is military bound, so I also don't know what leeway or what if the military is going to look at that COVID asterisk as colleges are or not. So, um, yeah, so the military is going to look at his ASVAT score. So when you look at the well, ASVAT, right. what he was able to do, it's going to lead what he's able to do in the military. So, right, right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm looking ahead to a, a tentative uh, date for our next meeting. And uh, as you are aware, the, our teaching staff's coming back uh, the first week of February, the first through the fifth. And the following Monday, our pre-K one students will be starting on Monday the eighth. I'm suggesting that we have our next task force meeting on Tuesday, February 16th, which would be the week preceding the return of our second and third graders on February 22nd. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, you with it? Okay, we'll go with it. 
Well, we've um, had 33 people stay with us the entire evening through this meeting. Uh, great turnout. Every meeting we've had has had an excellent turnout. Really appreciate the participation. So with that, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the night with your family and um, stay in touch. Call us, uh, text us, email us. If you have any questions, we're ready to respond at any time. Thank you very much and good night. Carrie. Oh.